Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Uh, we don't have any drinking intro tonight because we got a business meeting later. <laughs> um, so we won't start drinking until we get there. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the way that works here in the Libertarian Party. Yeah. Um, so, as promised, uh, Brexit episode. Uh, as uh, predicted, they are almost certainly delaying again. Kicking it down the curb. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I don't know where this is going to go. I, I, actually, I have yeah. some ideas, but we'll, we'll see when we see, and we'll, we get to either... Praise me for my brilliant predictions later. The, you can call me prophetic, or you can call me an idiot, depending on how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it could go a couple of different ways, but it's if they. Tr- the thing is, if they truly did want to get out, they would just do it. Mm-hmm. They they have pushed this thing and pushed it, which tells me that that they've just kind of been waiting for a second referendum to try to do a redo. Yeah, I, I think so too. So. Um, I why don't you give us some background on the the history of this whole? Um, this whole well, mess? the um the EU kind of got its start after at the end of World War II, um, and the six founding countries were Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg. Um, you got it, <laughs> Luxembourg, it. and the ne- and the Netherlands, um, and Denmark, Ireland, and then the United Kingdoms joined. Um, in 73 so that's that's kind of where we got where it all began Mm -hmm. and it it started as just as as simply uh economic deal it Mm -hmm. wasn't supposed to be a whole bunch of um laws and stuff like that it was just we're all going to kind of work together to to strengthen our own economies together i mean it was initially just like a big free trade pact yeah right exactly you know, we won't charge tariffs for any of your goods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean that was that was the idea, and then um, which when when the UK joined, which was in ninety one, they um they actually opted no, out. They were no, 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 no. They joined earlier. Oh, they, they no, they, they joined, joined in, in like not my bad seventy something. They joined in seventy something. My bad, I misspoke. But when the um, what I meant was when they started with the with the euro Mm -hmm. when they were starting the process to to do the euro um the only way the uk would stay in then was if they they had if they could not be part of the euro they didn't want anything to do with that yeah it's because their currency was already strong um everybody else they were trying to uh they switched all the other EU countries over to the euro to try and compete with the U.S. dollar. Yeah. Because um, the U.S. dollar like greatly overshadowed the uh, German marks and the um, Italian lira and the French francs and everything else. Um, yeah. But the the pound, the British pound, was already competitive with yeah. the dollar. Yeah. Um, and so they didn't want to give up their currency. Yeah. And I, I will speak from experience also that you still can't use a euro in Britain. Really? <laughs> yes. Um, when I uh, when I went from the Netherlands to the UK, mm. I had to change all my euros that I'd already <laughs> had to change my dollars into euros when I got into Europe. And then I had to change all my euros into pounds when I got into Britain. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. a hassle. Yeah, they did not accept euros. It's like, but you can literally drive to where they do. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. So, so yeah, that was, and the the euro actually went into effect in two thousand two. Yeah. That was when that was when it finally. But they but the process was started way back in ninety one. It took that long to to get that mm-hmm. off the ground. I guess. Do you know what uh, what delayed it? Do you know if it was just like negotiations among the country, fair exchange rates that they were arguing I, about or something like that? I think it was something along those lines, but but I don't, I can't say with a lot of certainty. Mm-hmm. Like I say, I read a little bit on it today, but not, not nothing that was really solid what that big delay was because yeah. that's kind of a while, you know? Yeah. Well, um, I know that uh, Theresa May was meeting with either yesterday or today was meeting with um, EU representatives, uh, mostly, I think, or at least the, the big stops were going to be uh, Angela Merkel of Germany and, um, and Macron in France. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a really good reason for that. I, you know, Germany really kind of controls the EU, even though the seat's in Belgium. Yeah. Um, and, uh, 
and France. I, I okay, so Macron is definitely playing hardball with this. He's been um, he's been very difficult. May just be French personality, hard to say, <laughs> but uh, he's been very difficult with the um, the UK and as far as the constant delays and trying to change the deals and so on and so forth. Um, I I think that it's actually probably because he would be perfectly content if they if they left the EU on bad terms. Yeah. Um, I I think that he actually does want them in, but the the truth is, if the UK left the EU, that would make France uh, an undisputed number two. Yeah. yeah. In there would there would be a power step up for them. Yes. Yeah. Um. Now. Germany, I don't know that it much matters to them either way, except that uh, the these countries that are all in on the EU and and Macron is definitely all in on the EU. He's a yeah. he's a big government guy. He <laughs> wants this big, you know, multinational government. Yeah. Um, and uh, the the problem with letting the UK leave is that it may trigger other countries to leave as well, and yeah. they're their nice big powerful central government that they've built up especially if if the uk leaves and and becomes stronger because of it because that that'd really be the fear is that mm. you know yeah now that they've left they have became this even more of a powerhouse than they already are mm-hmm. um then that would definitely encourage some other people to 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 rethink their position yeah how do you feel about brexit personally are you for it? Are you against it? Do you not care? I mean, I'm. I mean, honestly, I probably fall into so much. Don't care. I've I've have been following it, and I am for it. I mean, I know all I can kind of do is put myself in the shoes of if I lived in the UK, mm-hmm. and I know if I if I'd lived there, I'd want out of it. Yeah, that's just kind of my perspective. Why? You know, just because it's more government, and mm-hmm. it's and it's government not at home. Yeah, it's um, another layer, and it's farther farther away exactly yeah um i i agree uh i am i am for secession movements everywhere yeah yeah. um our that's definitely my default position Mm -hmm. now i can be swayed depending on variables but you know i'm definitely all about (laughs) secession as you all know from our fancy logo one of our principles is self-government yeah. And so uh, each step that you take away from the citizens that are actually being governed is um, is the opposite of what we think is important to to f- to maintain freedom for people. Absolutely. Right? Um, and they the EU has become the same kind of thing as our federal government. Um, as we've mentioned more than once on on this program, yeah. the the intent of the United States of America was that each state was an independent sovereignty, yeah. um, that they had come to agreement on a few things, and it was essentially a uh, a defensive and an economic alliance, and not much more than that. Yeah. Um, there were very few uh, few powers that were given to the federal government initially, uh, and um, the idea was that the states would kind of rule themselves, except in these couple of areas that the federal government was given power. And, of course, the states had a lot more say in the federal government at the time because while the representatives were popularly elected uh, by the people, the um, the states selected their senators. Yeah. The The senators were representatives of the states to the federal government, not uh, the people of the state. Yeah. Um, and, and, frankly, the as we – I think we said last week, might have been the week before um, – or episode before, the president was also a representative of the states. Yeah. And he was a representative of the states as a collective to to the international to the you know, to the rest of the nations in the world. He was like the chief diplomat. Exactly. Um and he was supposed to uh negotiate on behalf of the states as a collective for the for the United States, not to be a representative of the people at all. Yeah. And that was really the smart way to set it up. I mean that was but we've drifted. I mean, that's completely off the table now. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened in the EU as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, so they formed originally as a economic and defensive alliance. Yeah. Um, although it was, it was really an economic. I think alliance. it was more economic from what I was reading today than mm-hmm. than it was. I mean, defense was a very small part of it. Yeah, they had NATO separate. Yeah, you know. I mean, exactly. Um, and uh, but it's become 
a, a legislative body, yeah. a, a central government over the entire, like each of the nations within the EU. Yeah. And I mean, they, they do, the EU imposes a lot of laws and stuff like that, even just onto the people, even beyond businesses and stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, like they're very, very totalitarian. In my view. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I think some people would argue against them being totalitarian, but I understand I your know. point. Um, yeah. I mean, but, you know, they they do a lot of the same ridiculous things that our government does. Yeah. You know, uh, legislating how much water can pass through a, a shower head. <laughs> exactly. And, and things like this. So. To me, that's totalitarian. Yeah. Like, okay. I, want, <laughs> I, want, I want the shower head I want. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, now, I, so I think that the whole... I think that this was the plan all along. Really? All right. So here's, you know. Put your conspiracy hat on. Yeah, (laughs) maybe. I mean, um, so the most people in government, the majority of people in government and certainly in the media and so forth are generally in favor of government control of many more things than we would approve of. Absolutely. Um, And... uh, you gotta turn those things off, man. Yeah, my bad. I normally interrupt the whole show <laughs> so that somebody can send you a text message. Actually, it's probably it's, some kind of alert. Right? It's it's about the meeting tonight. So oh, okay. <laughs> just so you know, like, it, not that that makes it okay. Yeah. Well, you already knew. Yeah, so. We know to be there. <laughs> yeah. Um. So anyway, the I, I would say that most of the media and most of the government, all, all these people that feel that government's the answer to everything, were already inimical to secession they they yeah. were opposed to secession to begin with um that you know and even uk legislatures if you legislators i should say um in the same way that in this country the house of representatives keeps giving up more and more of its power to the president yeah um because they don't want to be responsible uh for any of this um it's the same I think it's the same thing going on over there that a, a majority of the people in government would just assume not have the responsibility of of this power. They just, you know, it's easier to take well, the paycheck and not have to do anything and for it's, it. It's and easier to run for election if you if you never have to take a stand. If you haven't had to take a hard stand, yeah. Because when you take a hard stand, you have people that are going to be for you and they're going to be against you, and mm-hmm. it's just it it mucks the waters up as far as trying to to run an easy campaign. Yeah. Well, and uh, we didn't get the chance to talk last week about Zuckerberg and his oh, um, man. request. I mean, but this is the same kind of thing, his request to have legislation passed to govern his industry. Yeah. I mean, there's more to it than this, but uh, uh, certainly a part of it is that it protects him. It, it insulates yeah. him from any kind of liability as a result of this, of the decisions that are being made. Well, that... um, besides the fact that the way our government works is he would get to craft the legislation and they would just pass and it. And they would just pass it. Um, but yeah. it... it it insulates him from having to make decisions that might upset people. Yeah. It, he can just sit back and say, well, I, it's just the law. The government made me do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so I, I think that they, they tend to do the same thing. Uh, for the most part, um, these people don't, don't want to withdraw and have the responsibility of actually governing a nation. Yeah. Um, it's easier to pass the buck. And, so, but there was, you know, there was discussion about it back, way back when, it was only a few years ago, actually, but, yeah. and uh, they, so they held the referendum, and it was like the 2016 presidential campaign here, in that the results were not expected. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I, rem- I was, remember when that, it was a big deal. <laughs> yeah. So you had Nigel Farage out there, like, screaming and yelling about how important it was for the UK to withdraw from the EU. But it was kind of seen as a, as a joke in the same way that the Trump campaign was seen as kind of a joke. And nobody yeah. expected it to be even close. It was supposed to be obviously Just a landslide yeah, the other way. to remain yeah. in the same way that it was supposed to be a landslide for Hillary Clinton. Yeah. And it turned out now here, at least in the Electoral College, it became a landslide for Trump. Yeah. By the way, I just want to remind you that I did call the 26 te- 2016 <laughs> yes, presidential campaign about two months before, like sometime yeah. in September. I said, yeah, Trump's going to win this. Yeah. Um, and man, I should have put some money down. <laughs> All right. Oh, well. Too late now. Um, but anyway, then in the UK, it was very close. Yeah. And uh, so it was about 50-50, but 
the referendum fell towards Brexit. They wanted to withdraw from the EU. Yeah. And uh, David Cameron, who was the um, prime minister at the time, like quit. Yeah, he stepped as a result. down. I remember <laughs> that. He sure did. Now, it, you could take this one of two ways. Either like he was, in, well, I guess there's multiple ways to look at it. Maybe he was embarrassed about that he didn't think it was going to happen and it did. He saw it as a, a referendum on him, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because he was a Remainer, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. It could be that he felt that he couldn't follow through on that. I think yeah. that makes him not much of a representative, personally. But yeah. um, that's actually the one I always lean towards: is that he was he was against this from the beginning, and he just couldn't see himself leading this movement. Yeah, the other direction. Yeah, yeah. and I, I I prefer to think of it that way. Although, again, like I said, he's. He's an elected representative. You have to represent the people that you don't agree with, too. That's Well, and that's absolutely true. <laughs> that, that's part of the job. It is. Um, at any rate, uh, so Theresa May took over as prime minister. Now, she was a Remainer, too. I was too. fixing to say she's a Remainer, too. Which, I mean, and that's kind of where I stand on this. I kind of feel like she's been, been kind of just screwing things up intentionally. Like negotiating a bad deal that she knew wouldn't pass. Mm-hmm specifically just to keep so that we'd have another referendum and they'd end up staying in. Um, yeah, they, uh, there was another U- UKIP, um, which is the Nigel Farage's party, the UKIP, uh, Gerard Batten. Yeah. I think that's how you say his last name. Um, anyway, I, I actually heard an interview with him recently. I can't remember where it came from probably BBC because most of what I get out of there ends up being <laughs> BBC. But yeah. anyway, um, he had said that, that the way this should have gone down instead of all these deals, and we'll go back to the, this negotiation with the EU, but the way that it should have gone down is that they should have just repealed the 1972 European Communities Act, offer free trade or WTO to the EU, whichever they prefer. Yeah. I mean, because there already is a, a there already is a framework, a framework for to do free this. trade. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and then offer reciprocal citizens' rights, um, you know, in, essentially in the same way that my driver's license here in Alabama still works in Mississippi, you yeah. know, that kind yeah. of thing. And um, and begin, at that point, I suppose, repealing their 46 years of legislation that's come down from the EU that that they want to get out of, yeah. um, which was the impetus for a lot of people that wanted to leave. Yeah, which um, I was fixing to say, once again, that's had I lived in, had I lived in the UK, that's the reason I would be for leaving, mm-hmm. is for just because of that, just to remove all of this government that has been... Dude, your phone is me. super noisy. <laughs> yeah, it's all meeting stuff, man. I'm there, there, we've got a group chat going about the LP meeting tonight. <laughs> on the floor or something. Oh. Maybe I will. <laughs> um, now, what actually happened is that Theresa May began negotiating with the EU terms of leaving. Yeah. Now, here's where the my conspiracy hat really comes in. All right. right. I'm ready. So, um, the EU doesn't want the UK to leave because they're an economic powerhouse. They they support the EU in a lot they of ways. They contribute a lot. Right. Yeah. Um, so, Theresa May doesn't actually want to leave, but... She, that's the position she's yeah, been put in. that's her in. job. Yeah. The EU doesn't want the UK to leave either. Yeah. Um, so they present a bad deal, a disadvantageous deal for the UK. Yeah. Um, May agrees, <laughs> I mean, with some Concessions. revisions yeah. and so forth, to a bad deal. Yeah. Um, at least according to most of the you know, most of the criticism that I've read, it's it's yeah. it doesn't it's certainly more advantageous to the EU than the UK. Yeah. Um, and so then this bad deal that they keep bringing back and placing before the people again and again and I again and again. I think they've done that, like, what, three times now? Four times, maybe? Maybe. It know. may there's, be up to four, because I may have missed one. There's There's been a bunch of votes on it. Yeah. Of course, now, for their part, Parliament can't figure out what they want to do either because not only did they vote down the deal, yeah. they voted down no deal. Yeah. They voted down 
redoing it. They <laughs> voted down. They literally I mean, have voted down everything. Like, yeah. They can't, they can't get anything through there right yeah. now. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, they presented something like eight options yeah. of how to proceed forward, and they voted no on all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And that pretty much covered all the potential well, ways forward. So, <laughs> welcome to the divided government. To <laughs> yeah. me, that was just a vote. And, and I remember when that happened, that t- what I took from that was that this is, this is a way for us to, to have a hard Brexit. Like, if you voted against all of these, mm-hmm. you're basically voting for a hard Brexit, which is what I think they probably need. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was supposed to be, what, March 29th? Yeah. And then it was moved to, to this Friday, April 12th. Yeah. Um, and now they're talking about the, what are they calling it? The flextension? I flextension? Think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a new um, one. I hadn't heard that so one. So it's like uh, they're giving them up uh, like a year, up yeah. to a year to figure out how they want to you know proceed forward and really? um but they'll have them participate in the eu elections that are coming up this year yeah. uh which you know if i were other member countries in the eu i would be i would be skeptical <laughs> of that like yeah. this country that wants to leave our union is now going to get a say in our budget and all kinds and of I everything mean, like, yeah. yeah a little a little strange but um getting back to the bad deals uh, I think that it was. I think that it was intentional. I think yeah. that the idea was to make Brexit, the the prospect of of Brexit, um, appear increasingly detrimental to the average citizen in the UK. Yeah. Um, to try and shift some di- votes and the, to continue to delay this and delay this and delay this until a point where they can offer a second referendum yep. to overturn the initial referendum and stay in the EU after all, which yep. is what the majority of government wanted to begin with. Yep. Um, and from my perspective, like all the UK citizens should be opposed to a second referendum. Yeah. They should all be opposed to a second refer- referendum because what it really shows is that the government isn't interested in democracy yeah. unless it fits their own agenda. Unless unless you, you get two choices, as long as you pick the right one, we'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you pick the wrong one, we're just going to choose again. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like when your girlfriend asks you if you want to go to dinner here or here. Yeah. Like, they give you the option, but the truth is you're supposed to pick the right one. Exactly. And you will be overruled if you pick the wrong one. Exactly. It's the illusion of choice. <laughs> exactly. Right? So, um, and then at this point, they're just going to try and make it intolerable until they feel that they've changed enough minds that they can put another referendum out there, get people to vote the way that they want them to vote. And then it gives you the the illusion of choice. Then it seems like democracy in action um, because you've gotten to vote to overturn the original democracy in action. But people don't think of it that way. Um, You know, it's like this... Good thing we have democracy to save us from democracy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, I just think of, uh, and we may want to go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, I'm not sure how far how yeah. far in we are. We're a little over 20 minutes. Because um, then this way I can end on a quote, and it's it's yeah. one of my one of my favorites. Yeah, and like I said, I don't have a whole lot more to say on Brexit anyway. And we do have a meeting to get to. So. Yeah. Um, so one of my favorite quotes is Benjamin Franklin on democracy, because, of course, you know, when they came out of the Constitutional Convention, uh, the the question was, you know, did you give us a monarchy or did you give us a republic? And they, they responded that it, it's a republic if you can keep it, which we haven't really pulled which off. But not done. Um, yeah. They very intentionally avoided democracy, yeah. uh, which, by the way, is, you know, we'll have to have a future episode on all these calls to get rid of the. Um, the electoral college. Oh man, yeah. Um, because there's a lot of them, and and people suddenly want direct democracy, but our founding fathers very intentionally avoided direct democracy because of its pitfalls. Yep. And Benjamin Franklin has this quote that I that I love that like summed it up really well. He said, "Democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for lunch." Yep. It abs- and it absolutely is. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, we didn't mention it. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna. I'm going to try and stick this this other little clip in here oh, somewhere. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, there, I, I pulled it from the No Agenda program, or the No Agenda show, uh, which if you guys don't listen to, you should check that one out too. It's long. It I mean, it's long. about three hours uh, twice a week. 
I try to um, listen to it as often as I can, but I'll be honest, it's it's a lot to get through. But they but it's it's news deconstruction. Mm-hmm. So they it's these two guys and they basically watch all of this news and just deconstruct for you exactly what's going on. Yeah. Um, and Word choice and how they're all working together to push a particular agenda and it's it, yeah. it's a very good program. Mm-hmm. Um I try like I say, I try to listen as often as I can. Yeah. So they uh they actually pulled a clip and I pulled it from them. So, so I stole their clip um of a uh discussion with Roger Daltrey of the Who uh, about his feelings about Brexit and um it's just it's funny. So maybe we end with that clip. Uh right. we'll stick it in here like right about now. Brexit looks like it's getting further and further oh, away. God, is know. is it going to is it going to be bad for for British rock music? No, I do the rock bit. What's it called? It's going to do the rock business. Is there a tour in Europe? Oh dear, that? as if we didn't tour in Europe before the f***ing EU. Yeah, if you want to sign up to be ruled by a f***ing mafia, yeah. you do it. <laughs> like being governed by FIFA. Thanks uh, everybody for coming by. Remember you can find us on Facebook, on iTunes, and I still haven't done the Stitcher thing, but I'll get around to it. <laughs> um, if you enjoy the show... Recommend us to your friends. Uh, share, please. We'd like to build an audience. We feel like we're doing something pretty good here. Um, if you agree, we want to hear. If you disagree... I'd like to hear that, too. Yeah, exactly. So, everybody, uh, try and stay free. Have a good night. Ciao. Later.